We're gathered here this evening to celebrate a wonderful event, the 125th anniversary of the Fort Worth Club. Business leaders of Fort Worth started the club in 1885. The name of the club at that time was the Commercial Club. A few years later, you know, some of the members of the club decided, well, the Commercial Club, the name of it sounded a little bit like the Chamber of Commerce, and so they wanted something that, you know, reflected a little bit more of what they were doing. And by this time, not only were they talking about literary and scientific endeavors and maintaining the, uh, the library, you know, they were, you know, they were talking about within the confines of the club, they were talking about big deals being made here. In 1886, the commercial club opened its new home at 6th and Main. The building cost $40,000, and the library was called second to none. The Military Review in 1918 of the Fighting Panthers going to France was done from the rooftop of the Fort Worth Club at 6th and Main. They marched down Main Street as a prelude to leaving for France during World War I. Governor William Hobby reviewed the parade from the Fort Worth Club. And Governor Hobby reportedly said that it was the grandest crowd that he had ever witnessed. And there were 400,000 people on Main Street or in the city to view this wonderful military parade. The six-story building, the second home of the Fort Worth Club, Haltoms was a major tenant. They actually were a tenant in the commercial club. Haltoms was there from 1914 to 1960. And Mr. Halton was obviously a, a leader in the community. And then there were just other tenants, office tenants, and then the club occupied uh, floors uh, three through six. And on the sixth floor, they had this beautiful dining room. And it was a very special place to go for dinner or for a Sunday brunch. We acquired the building and uh, put the building on the National Register of Historic Places, not for its uh, architectural elements, but, but because of the historical significance. It was the second home of the Fort Worth Club. It was the charter members of the club, really, people like Captain B.B. Paddock and, and Major Cleaver Van Zandt and John Peter Smith, I think, was mayor at the time, Samuel Burke Burnett. And all of these men were not just charter members of the club, they were really the charter members of the city of Fort Worth. I mean, the history of the Fort Worth Club and the history of this community are so intertwined that they're truly inseparable. Mr. Carter's enthusiasm, not only for the club, but for the city, or is legendary. And so he took a great deal of pride, you know, in the club and what was happening in the city. So the, the activities that went on there, I think, were was deal-making, planning, you know. We were talking about public schools and uh, the hospital. John Peter Smith was a member of the club. You know, you just look at the members of that club, and then you look at what was going on in the city, you know, oil and gas and railroads and meat packing. I think a lot of those deals were formed in that club. I always stood in awe of Eamon Carter. He was a pretty, <laughs> in my mind, a pretty outstanding person. He held the Star-Telegram. He was an oil man's oil man. He was a rancher. Uh, he was a Texan born and bred. Being that I'm almost 87, 
and I don't remember coming here until I was older. Um, by the time we were 12, we girls, my best friends, we would come down on Saturdays to have lunch and then go to the Hollywood of the worst of movies. There weren't that many women around here. We were in the big dining room for my 14th birthday, I know. Dad was always having visitors who stayed in 10G, and Will Rogers was coming in and out, and he would leave his laundry here, leave the dirty and pick up the clean between in Los Angeles and New York and Washington. But he and Dad were great friends, and then all the visiting firemen who would come, Dad would put them up in 10G. And what I didn't know at that time were all the Russell watercolors were hanging down in those two rooms. Mother didn't want cowboys and Indians in the house. So as a result, I never saw the works of the Remingtons. Dad had one Remington in his office, but they were all on the men's floor and I was not allowed there till I was 21. So I can remember walking in and walking straight to the end of the library and there was the dash for the timber. All the athletic facilities, you couldn't, women couldn't go in the swimming pool because of the men skinny dipped. Why, why should I wear a swimming suit? They, they uh, all the men spread naked. Is it always? I guess, I, occasionally there's somebody who wears trunks or something like that. Have you always swum that way? Yes. Do you enjoy it? What'd you say? Do you enjoy that better? I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy it. A lot of things that happened in that club was the deal making, the deal making that was going on in this community, you know, over a, maybe a glass of, uh, probably not wine so much then, but over a drink and, uh, you know, in a poker game. Lots of things happened in that club. I can remember pictures uh, back in the late 20s and early 30s of, of uh, People like Eamon Carter and uh, my grandfather and Sid Richardson sitting down at a, at a poker table. They had to put their guns up on the, on the shelf so they wouldn't take them to the poker table. Eamon Carter usually was the man that kind of kind of ran those games and all the oil men would bring their friends in from Abilene and Midland and Oklahoma City and Tulsa and Shreveport and Houston and invite them to come in and play play cards with the boys from Fort Worth. These men lunched together, they played cards together, they had a drink or so together, and the business transactions and the back and forth intelligence and information that flowed was the perfect place. And they got it all done. My great uncle Sid Richardson and my grandmother Annie Bass lived down here on the ninth floor. On the east end was my grandmother's living room. And next to that was her bedroom. And then on the west end was my great uncle's uh, suite. And uh, I remember that there was a kind of a utility storage room in between, so you could walk between the two. Back in those days, these people didn't have to sign uh, contracts and all that kind of stuff like they do. Now they just shake hands and that was it. And that's all it, you know, that's what it was. If he tell you he's gonna do something, they do it. The 
it was a men's club. Of course, in those days, uh, women weren't nearly as involved in business as they are today. The ladies were working more downtown. They were active in the banks. They had their own businesses. And they wanted some place to come too. And uh, so we got the membership open for ladies. Uh, I got some conversation from some of the older members who didn't much want change of any kind, but uh, very little. And uh, it was really well received, I thought. I hadn't imagined this kind of a club. I only thought these kind of clubs were on the television. So I thought when I got here, I, I thought, oh, wow, look at this place. Because I didn't think places like this really existed. Last year, about this time, I celebrated my 40th year at the Fort Worth Club. We had a big party. I was kind of nervous about the party because I didn't think that the members cared enough to, to come to my party. So it was just, I was just in another world there for a while. I think the history and camaraderie of the club with its past keeps members here because it is a place where you can do business and make sure that uh, we continue that heritage that we've had all these years since for 125 years ago when we first started. That history includes the establishment of the Davy O'Brien National Quarterback Award, which began in the 70s and was spearheaded by Charles Ringler. The Davy O'Brien Hall of Fame is located inside the club on the 11th floor. Each year, the O'Brien Awards Dinner recognizes the nation's best college quarterback and college scholarship money is awarded to an outstanding high school senior student athlete as well. The event is a sellout each year. Oh, hell, we've had so many speakers you can't imagine. Nicest people you ever saw. Uh, every mayor that we've ever had uh, has spoken at the Breakfast Club. It's the members of this club that have been so involved in the community, in every aspect, through government, through education, uh, through business, through social activities. I mean, every person in this club is connected in some way with what's going on in the city. The continuation of the Fort Worth Club and its history and its leadership should continue well into the future. I, I would anticipate that the Fort Worth Club uh, will continue to be uh, a gathering place and of uh, both social activities and political activity. I hope the club doesn't get too big. I think it's important to keep their facilities current. It's the premier downtown club and, and it uh, has been ever since it started and of course it's grown through the years and I think uh, people, the business community likes to be a part of this club as well as the social community. and. Uh, it's, it's, say it is the premier uh, downtown club where people want to meet and you see a lot of people here when you come here that you like to see and that you know. Fort Worth Club has a bunch of businesses within a business. Uh, it has a parking garage and it has tenants. Uh, it has food service for its members. It has an athletic center. Um, it has a hotel and all these functions have to operate together in order to make this club worthwhile and make it profitable. And I think um, with Walter Littlejohn uh, as manager and the board of governors that we assembled, uh, we turned that corner and made this club a, uh, a profitable club with uh, redu while we were reducing its debt. I think it's important to tell this story and continue the legacy because it, uh, it builds our community. It shows we are a community of people who want to do things, who want to accomplish things, who want to succeed. And that uh, we need to illustrate that and show that that happens at the Fort Worth Club. I really know too much to be five, and it's been, people been doing, trying to get me to talk for years, and I just don't have anything to say about it. 
and that's one reason why they all like me. I could hear what they were saying, and I'm not going to repeat it. And I told them before they asked me to come up here and do this, I said, now don't be asking me nobody's name or what to do, because I'm not going to tell you. And I've been that way all my life. I started here when I was 21. I'm 85 now, and I still feel that way. I do not going I don't have nothing derogatory to say about it. So if these walls could speak, I'm sure there would be lots of interesting comments.